diagnosed it. Apart from that, COPD. Now, a lot of uh, obstructive lung diseases are very, very common in India, especially not just asthma because of allergies or hereditary problems, but, but also COPD, not only because of smoking, but also in India, there is a lot of exposure to um, chula smoke, which we say the biomass fuel exposure, the biogas, uh, the domestic fuel exposure. So a lot of it is that, and also pollution. Uh, there is also a certain subsegment of uh, COPD patients, which is actually post tubercular, again, very common in India. So uh, not it's not that you know COPD is only common globally. It's actually one of the three most common causes of mortality in India. And if you if I talk about Rajasthan, it is actually the highest, uh, uh, the most common cause of mortality in Rajasthan alone. And uh, of course, it's actually just increasing by every year. Uh, there is this. Um, society, which is called the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Diseases, which actually uh, gives out guidelines to uh, manage COPD. And it basically defines COPD as a preventable and treatable disease characterized by airflow limitation, which is not fully reversible. So it is not a curable disease. I want you all to understand that this is just a treatable disease. And you will actually get a lot of patients in the emergency room complaining of um, breathlessness, cough, chest tightness, which may actually be COPD. A lot of them will actually overlap maybe with asthma. A lot of them will actually overlap with cardiac problems as well. It, um, because it represents actually a huge spectrum of progressive, partially reversible or irreversible pulmonary diseases where inhalation of noxious uh, irritants contributes to local release of proteases and free radicals, which then actually lead to inflammatory response and permanent structural changes to the lung. Most of these structural changes are irreversible in the long run. They have been uh, historically categorized as twofold, that is destruction and enlargement of the bronchioles and alveoli, leading to decreased efficiency of expiration, uh, these patients are actually called the emphysematous type. And then there is this inflammation which manifests by mucus hypersecretion and distal airway obstruction, which is the bronchitis type. So emphysema and bronchitis together are actually COPD per se. A lot of them will have overlapping symptoms. A lot of them will have uh, very characteristically emphysematous or bronchitis symptoms. However, the management does not change drastically. Just to give you a picture skew view of how a normal bronchiolar and alveoli look, how healthy like a balloon, and when they are affected by emphysema, they are actually, all of them are dilated. They do not have very, very good participation in the gas exchange, and that is what makes them not really great for these patients to breathe. Whereas when you talk about chronic bronchitis, Basically, their bronchial tubes are inflamed. The alveoli may not be that dilated. So acute exacerbation, like I said, it is very common. Gold defines it as an event in the natural history of the disease marked by acute worsening of dyspnea, cough, and or sputum outside of one's daily variant. Now, the causes for this exacerbation may be many. It could be seasonal change. It could be a viral infection. It could be a pneumonia. It could be a bacterial infection. It could be a lot of other things. Uh, this frequency is found to correlate with the increased rate of lung, uh, uh, lung function decline, which is measured by the peak expiratory flow and FEV1, reduced quality of life and increased mortality. So these patients, you often tell them on an OPD basis to monitor their FEV1. And if it falls below, a port, um, um, they can do it with a peak expiratory flow meter also. And if it falls below, 10%, you usually ask them to report to the emergency, report to the OPT. Majority of these uh, exacerbations are caused by tracheobronchial tree infections, usually viral or bacterial. And of course, there are other precipitants which may lead to, uh, which may include exposure to non infectious airway irritants, pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure, pneumothorax, effusions, mucus plugging, and sometimes anxiety. So, even any kind of stress will may 
uh, you know, land them up in the ER and um, with sometimes very low oxygen levels, sometimes very high carbon dioxide levels. So that's how usually they would present to you. Treatment typically involves the use of uh, bronchodilators, inhaled bronchodilators, which would be uh, inhaled corticosteroids um, and uh, beta-2 agonists and uh, other than that, muscarinic uh, receptors. So uh, these are basically the backbone of uh, treatment of COPD exacerbations. You may even have to use systemic steroids along with other uh, bronchodilators. And if they, have, uh, if they present to you in a respiratory failure, non-invasive ventilator or invasive ventilation may also actually have a very, very important role. Of course, you cover them with good antibiotics, you give them prophylaxis for venous thrombo embolism because these patients are not only very prone for pulmonary embolism, they're also very prone to arrhythmias. Mm, for these patients, the one thing that I would really want all of us to, um, for none of the respiratory patients ever, you want a oxygen saturation of 100%. A saturation of 94 to 98% is actually acceptable for patients who do not have risk of carbon dioxide retention and for patients of COPD who have a risk for carbon dioxide retention, for patients of ILD who have a risk of carbon dioxide retention, a saturation of 88 to 92 percent is actually extremely acceptable. So that's what we accept and that's what is good enough for them. We do not want to hyperoxygenate them at any point. Coming to the other spectrum of the obstructive airway disease, which is asthma, which is basically reversible inflammation of the airways. It, uh, in cases of acute exacerbation, you will have patients presenting to you with classical uh, complaints of shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, and in varied combinations. One thing may be present, one thing may be absent. So that's how they would basically present to you. Uh, but when you have to actually differentiate between acute exacerbation and a poor control. So when a patient basically has poor control, there will be, will be diurnal variability. Whereas when a patient is in exacerbation, he would be breathless throughout the day. So that's what actually changes the management. Of course, the risk factors more or less remain the same. If the patient has had a previous severe exacerbation, he's more prone to uh, getting another exacerbation any history of hospitalization, any history of uh, presenting to the ER, any history of uh, excessive use of the inhalers that he has been uh, using continuously. If the uh, use has increased significantly over the past few weeks or months, of course, this uh, perception of symptoms by the patient. And uh, so basically, if you have a patient who has asthma, you would usually have them have a plan the doctor would give them a plan that, you know, this is when you step up your uh, inhalers. And if you need to use your inhaler very frequently, you come back to us. Of course, these are also patients who would be monitoring their PEFR at home. Especially people from low socioeconomic status or a poor understanding or a poor educational level are the ones who would actually present in the ER. They may also have history of drug use. They may also have history of smoking which may at times be overlapping with the COPD. They may have psychosocial problems, any kind of stress, any kind of excessive uh, stress would lead, land them up in the ER. Most of them may even have comorbid illness, especially diabetes, hypertension, cardiac problems, other chronic lung diseases or psychiatric diseases. So they're very, very prone to these problems. We uh, classify it into mild, moderate, severe, or sometimes even life-threatening, and the management basically depends on that. The idea being that we have to, A, ensure uh, proper oxygenation, control, um, have a good uh, heart rate, have a stable heart rate, have a stable respiratory rate, make sure that the patient is not using a lot of accessory muscles when he's breathing. So that is basically what our target is. Depending on how the patient is doing, what criteria he falls into, mild, moderate, severe, or life-threatening, we decide where he needs admission, whether he can go back home, whether he needs admissions in the ward, or whether he needs an ICU admission, and sometimes may even need mechanical ventilation. 
there is very fixed criteria for discharge which you will find on the internet uh, when it comes to uh, asthma internationally we follow gina guideline which is the global initiative for asthma control 